in, uh, um, that is the word today. All right? There's 69 times that the expression uh, today is used in the Bible, and it's used six times in the book of Hebrews, but the interesting part of it is that, interesting enough, is that half of the occurrences happen in chapter 3 of Hebrews. And so this morning, I want to you know, talk to you, I wanna, uh, you know, the sermon I want to preach to you this morning is called Procrastinators Unite Tomorrow, But Never Rest Today. Procrastinators Unite Tomorrow, But Never Rest Today. If you have your Bibles, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 3, let's start at verse 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was uh, faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had builded the house has more honor than the house. For every uh, house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a, uh, for a testimony of those things which, uh, which were to be spoken after. But Christ, after, uh, Christ as a son over his own house, whose, uh, whose house are we, if we hold fast the, the, the confidence and the uh, rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if we will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. And he said, and said, they do always error in their heart, and they, uh, they have not known my ways. So I swear in, in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in uh, departing from the living God, but, uh, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Let any of you be, uh, lest, any, sorry, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold, uh, hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, uh, howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that he had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom uh, swear uh, he that they, uh, they sh- uh, should not be entered in, uh, enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we, uh, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, I ask that you would give us ears to hear. Lord, I ask that the seed of your word would fall upon fertile soil upon our hearts this morning. God, I ask that we not just hear your word, but we would be doers of your word as well. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, obviously, like I said, the title of this is Procrastinators Unite Tomorrow, but Never Rest Today. And you may sit there and wonder, what are you trying to say? Well, what's a procrastinator? It's somebody that does what? Puts things off that they could be doing today for tomorrow. Right? It's someone that you know, keeps making excuses for why they couldn't do something today because they're going to do it next week or next month or next year. And so for some of us, you know, maybe there's houses around, or sorry, there's projects around the house that we're going, well, that would be me because you know what? I've been meaning to clean up this room or that room or this room, you know, all these different things. Or I've been meaning to fix this on my car or that on my car or whatever it may be. But the main reason that, you know, uh, that many, goal, uh, many of our goals are not achieved is that they are not begun or worked on today. The procrastinator's motto is, never do today what could be put off until tomorrow. Here are some, th- uh, there, here are some things that you should not and you better not put off until someday, but to do today. 
So you better do these things today. Number one is this. Be saved today, not tomorrow. Be saved today and not tomorrow. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says, Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today if ye, uh, uh, ye will hear his heart, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the, the day temptation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. That word provocation means provoke. What did people do to, uh, to the Lord in the wilderness? They provoked him to anger. That's why they're in the wilderness. They didn't want to believe. And the Bible even says right at the beginning, or sorry, right at the end of it, it says that they could not enter into the what? The promised land because of their unbelief. They weren't saved. They didn't want to believe on the Lord. So the idea that, you know, uh, that Israel, for the most part, you know, is because people will say, well, all of Israel will save. No, not all of Israel will save. Why? Because the Bible says that there was unbelief, that not everybody believed, not everybody was saved. And so, and it says, what happened to them? That their carcasses were what? They laid in the wilderness. Carcasses is another thing for their dead bodies, all right? If you don't know what that means. So they provoked the Lord to rest. So he's saying, you know what? If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart to it. Do what God says. If God says, you know what? If God's speaking to your heart, you're not saved. But the Bible says, you know, that all of a sudden you hear the Lord saying, be saved. Go get saved. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't say, well, I'll do it on a better day or I'll do it down the road. I've heard many of people have said, you know, I'll, you know what, in my 20s, I just want to go party it up. I want to, you know, in my high school years, I want to go party it up, do all these things. But when I get married, then I'll settle down. I'll go to church. I'll go get saved. I'll go do these things. You know what? There's a lot of people that never make it to that point. There's a not, a, and the thing is, is that we want to, and, you know, this is not a biblical term, but they want to tempt fate. In other words, I'm not using the fact of fate because the Bible doesn't talk about it, but they want to tempt the Lord. Because fate is the fact that God controls everything, if you want to put it that way. But fate, as most people think, well, you know, I have this you know, certain path that I'm going to go on, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and, and that's how it's going to be. I can't change it or whatever. You can change it. If the God is speaking to you today, you can change it today. Don't wait until tomorrow, next week, next year, next decade, you know, oh, when I'm on my deathbed. I remember a family member of mine said, you know what, maybe I'll get saved when I'm on my deathbed, but I'm having way too much fun, you know, partying and doing whatever I, uh, you know, I'm doing right now. I don't want to do it until my deathbed. That's tempting the Lord saying, you know what, you better keep me alive so I have that opportunity. The Lord doesn't owe you anything, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succured thee, which means help thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God, all throughout his words, he's, he gives us mercy. How does he do that? He offers us salvation, a free gift. What do we have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we are saved. That if we put our full faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that what he did upon that cross, that death, burial, and resurrection is enough to save you, the Bible says that you're saved. But so many people want to make it about themselves. They say, you know what, if I do that, then I'm not going to be able to do those things. I won't be able to go out and party. I won't be able to go out and do this. I remember empty promises that I made to the Lord. That's one of the reasons why I have a big problem with doing altar calls because I know that oftentimes people come down to do altar calls and they will make empty promises. They have all the intentions when they come down here, but as soon as they leave, they forget. So one of the ones that I remember is, is I remember you know, telling the Lord, say, Lord, you know what, it would be awesome if you came back, but it would be even more amazing if you would wait until I get married. Nobody else has ever had that thought in their mind, have they? Am I the only one? Oh, I saw one hand go up. I'm not going to say who, but there was you know, someone. But I, I honestly made that thing. I said, Lord, I said, you know what? I, I, I want you to come back. It would be awesome. It would be great. Yes, Lord, that would be it. But wait until I get married. That's stupid. I mean, to be honest, it is. It's just, and I'm not telling you, I'm telling you what I said. It's not like I'm pointing you out and going, you said that. You're stupid. No, I'm calling myself stupid because that was a dumb thing to say. You know, yes, obviously the Lord has not come, you know, has not come back yet. I'm married. And the thing is, is that 
That didn't change the whole fact. Don't sit there and make you know, promises that you, can't, you know, that you don't want to intend to keep. I mean, in my mind, I'm going, Lord, I mean, I'm saying that, but in my mind, I'm like, Lord, I want to get married first before you get back, before you come back. How dumb is that? Because you know what? If, I, if the Lord comes back, I'm in a better place than I was even if I'm here and I get married, right? Nobody else has had any kind of thoughts remotely uh, close to that, right? I've heard people make, Lord, I'll, I'll start doing your will if you do this. Like all those empty promises that we oftentimes make. You need to trust in Christ today. You know why? Because of the shortness of life. We don't know how long we have. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We don't know. There are, uh, there are people in high school and in junior high that died before they graduated. So it's not the fact that, you know, people sit there and think that, so, uh, that they have so much time that they're going to automatically live at least until they're 80 or 90. I met somebody the other day, and they changed their tune now, you know, recently, but I remember about 10 years ago, they said, you know what, I really don't want to live until, like, I'm really old, you know, like in the 70s. This is not me. This is another pastor who said this to me. Said, I don't want to live until like, I'm really old, like in my 60s or 70s, maybe like 50, because I'm still able to do stuff at that time. But I want to be, I was like, man, you have a poor view of life. Except for one thing, I have a grandfather in law who's 90 who can like out hunt me and, you know, tell me, you know, and sits, he sits there and says, Are you there? Are you there? Are you still behind me? But he, he went on to say, You know, I, I don't want to, I mean, maybe like 55. Maybe at the most 60 because I don't want to, I just don't want to be, you know, really old and, you know, in, in a nursing home. I don't, I don't want to be drooling. I'm, I'm like, man, you have a, a poor view of life, don't you? Funny thing is, is now that he is like in his 50s, he's like, well, maybe I'll think about, you know, no, I don't, you know, just Lord, you know, just keep me going. All of a sudden, the, you know, the whole tune changes when he gets older. It always does because my daughter, amazing as she is, says that I am old. See? I'm not hiding anything. And she's like, you're so old. And then other times, she's like, Dad, you're, you're young. You're so young. I'm like, what do you want? And so she'll sit there and say, like, and, and, you know, that I'm in my you know, mid-40s. I'm 46, and she'll say, well, you're old. Well, the thing is, I remember when I was her age, I thought like 20. Man, it's like, you're over the hill, man. You might as well just be like digging a grave now. And then as I, you know, got in my 20s, I'm like, oh, man, like 40. Whew, can never. And then as I got in my, you know, now in my, in my 40s, I'm like 120. That's about, I think that's probably considered old because that's as, as far as the Lord said that I can go is 120. So, you know, as you, it's like, as you get older, you begin to realize, you know what, I might want to live a little longer. You know, I'm not saying that if I were to pass away, you know what, I'm ready to go. If I were to pass away, you know, before 120, I'm ready to go. Why? Because I know in whom I have believed. I know in whom I have believed. That's why, you know what, you need to be saved today and not tomorrow. So many times we've met people at doors or we talk to people about the Lord, and they'll sit there and they'll tell you, they're like, well, maybe I'm not quite right. I remember two weeks ago, we were over at Taven. I met this one gentleman. I was talking to him, thought he was going to get saved, and then all of a sudden he goes, yeah, I don't think, I don't think right now I, I really want to do that. Like, he just honestly thought about it, and he's like, I, I, I do. But I don't want to do it right now. And I'm like, I mean, it's like it's so close. So close. It's like, but people want to tempt fate. You need to trust Christ today because of the suddenness of death. Suddenness, I mean, there's so many people that will sit there. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody, or maybe that you've experienced this, or maybe you, you yourself have said this, you get a phone call, and all of a sudden you hear that so-and-so has passed away, and you're like, what are you talking about? I just talked to them yesterday. I mean, death doesn't sit there and ask you for, you know, for your permission to, you know, to, you know, oh, is it okay for you to die today? Oh, okay, then I'll do it. It doesn't. It just, it, it just happens. Here's the other, re- you know, the other reason is this. Because of the sentence upon you now if you're not saved. There's a sentence upon your life if you're not saved. It says this in John 3, 18. It says, he that believeth on him is not condemned. 
But he that belie- uh, believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The Bible says that if you're not saved, you're condemned already. The sentence is upon you. You're going to hell. That's what the Bible says, that if you don't believe on the Lord, if, you haven't been sa- if you're not saved, you- that's where you're going. But the Bible says, you know, also it says, if you've already believed on him, you're not condemned. If you're saved, you're not condemned. Why? Because you're not going to go to hell. Because that's what the Bible t- you know, uh, teaches us. Trust in Christ today. Why? Because of the sorrows of hell. There was this uh, one teenager that I called every single week. I was a, uh, I was a youth leader. I was newly saved. I think I was about 23, 24, you know, youngster. And I called this one kid. You know, I was being like an apprentice under other leaders and stuff. And so they were, they said, hey, call this guy. You know, gave me a couple you know, people to call. I would call him up. I'd call this one guy every single week. Always, I have to work. I can't do it right now. And this kid grew up in church, mind you. Him and his sister both grew up in church. He's like, I got to work. I can't do it. I can't, you know, I won't be there. You know, thanks for calling, but I can't do it. I call him every single week without fail. But about two months later, he ended up committing suicide. And he, obviously, he never came to church. And I sat there, and I, and I began to weep and cry because he got to that point to where he didn't see a point to life anymore. And the reason why I can say, you know, that, that more than likely he wasn't saved is because of the fact of what they found underneath his bed. They found, like, a, a satanic Bible, you know, a Bible of Satan. And he had other things, you know, other paraphernalia. I don't want to go into deep detail about it. But that was actually the reason why I grieved even more is because I knew where he was and where he wasn't. I knew that he was in hell and that he was not in heaven. You say, how dare you judge I believe what God's word says, that if you believed on him, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe on him, then you already stand condemned. And that grieves my heart because the thing is that oftentimes I think people get the idea that Christians are so happy when, when a, a sinner or a heathen goes to, you know, goes to hell. No, it grieves my heart because they're, they're there for in, in eternal torment, eternal suffering, eternal pain. Never to be relieved. So if you ever think you know, to yourself, hey, if I just take myself out of this life and you're not saved and you're like, I'm going to get relief from it because all the pain's going to go away. You know, I don't need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to get out of this life. I'm going to you know, bring my own relief. Killing yourself and you ending up in hell is not going to bring a relief. It's going to bring more pain, more suffering. Why? Because that's the wrath of God that's going to be upon you. Please don't do that. I think, of, you know, I think of people in the Bible that were this close to being saved, but were not. Think about King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 28. He says, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? This is Paul talking to him. Paul you know, began to lay it out for him and said, King Agrippa, you know what? You need to get saved. And he begins to share how to get saved. And then he goes like, you know what? You almost persuaded me. Then you have Felix. In Acts chapter 24, verse 25, that says, when I have a convenient season. Whenever it's convenient for me, then I'll go do it. Whenever there's a point in my life where it seems convenient, you know, when it's going to benefit me, then I'll get saved. These are all excuses that people make, right? You know what the thing is, is that no decision is the shortest road to hell. When you say, I'm not going to make a decision... Like, I can't do it. I've met people that say, well, I'm not going to make a decision today because, you know, I believe all these things. They're like, I, I just want to leave my options open. Well, you know what? Making no decision is still a decision because you're still not saved. Number one, as I said, is be saved today, not tomorrow. Number two is this, serve God today. Serve God today. Verse 12, the Bible reads, take heed, brethren, lest... There be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. As I told you earlier uh, in, in earlier chapters, this book was not only written to Bible-believing, saved Hebrew people, but it was also written to unbelieving Hebrew people, this group of people that, uh, that Paul ends up writing it to. 
And so what does he say here? He, sa- you know, he says, uh, if, uh, uh, sorry, take heed of uh, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The thing is, is that they already were in unbelief. They're not saved. He's telling them that today is the day. Today is the day to serve God. Today is the day to get saved, obviously, first, and then uh, serve God. So Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, a lot of you have this on your wall. And it's, a, it's a beautiful saying. Most people have it in there. It's a nice decorative picture on the wall that they put up there. Everybody's like, oh, that's just a beautiful saying. No, when Joshua writes this, he's giving an ultimatum. When Joshua writes this, he says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the God of the God which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's telling you, there's an ultimatum in this whole thing. You can go on serving whoever you want to, but you need to declare you know, who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God, or are you going to serve all the false gods? That's what he's telling you. He goes, you know what? You guys can do whatever you want. God has given you that choice. He says, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that my family is saved and on their way to heaven, that they are growing in their relationship with the Lord. If you don't serve him today, today is, and I'm not saying like you're serving him, it has nothing to do with salvation. I'm talking about the fact that you're saved, but you're not serving him. That's called backslidden. So if, you're, if you don't serve him today, today you are out of the will of God. You're not in God's will. Some people will sit there and say, you know what? Something does not feel right to me. Something just seems out of whack. Check your relationship. That's the reason why the Bible says you know, to test, to examine yourselves. To see if there's something wrong. And I'll tell you this. God's in the same place that he's always been. Where'd you leave him? You're the one you know, who decided to leave him, you know, leave him and go do something else. If you don't serve him today, then you are out of the work of God. Oftentimes people, you know, especially you know, maybe those ones that are watching online, can be people here you know, at church as well, but they're not in the work of God. You say, well, I'm here. I showed up, didn't I? Well, thank you. I, I, I do appreciate, I'm not saying that sarcastically. I do appreciate you being here. I do. But there are other things to do in God's house. Some are like, man, I knew I should have skipped this Sunday. <laughs> Some of you, you know, you need to follow up the Lord in that next step by getting water baptized. You say, well, I don't, I don't need that to be saved. I'm not saying that you did. But the Bible says that you should get baptized. Why? Because then people know that you're identifying as a believer. That what you're doing as, as you're brought down in that water, that's your de- you know, that you're dead to your old life and that you're being raised to new life in Christ. That's what... Baptism is. It's symbolic. It has nothing to do with you, whether or not you're saved. It has everything to do with the fact you're saying, you know what, I'm a believer in Christ, and I want people to know it. The other way is, you know, church membership. Some of you, you know, maybe have been going here for years, you're still not members of the church. You're going, you know, why do I have to be a member of the church? Well, you know what? I'll, say, I'll put it this way. If there's stuff going on in church that you don't like, you don't have a say unless you're a member. So if you're a member of the church, you have a say. May not always be heard, but you know you have a say, right? Because we can't do everything, right? We can't, you know, we can't, you know, somebody may want a room, you know, painted pink. We might, we're probably gonna have to veto that idea, right? You know, it's a good idea. I mean, you know, it's a good idea that room needs to be painted, just not that color, all right? Another one would be the fact of teaching. I'm so thankful that you know that Doc. At the beginning of this year, said, you know what? Heard the voice of the Lord, said, you know what? I need to teach. Uh, the, the Lord said, you know what? You need to teach Sunday school. He's been doing it ever since. I thank God for that. Some of you, uh, you know, some of us need to stop making excuses and say, you know what? Or like, I'm too nervous. My hands get sweaty. I'm a- Anytime you do anything new, that's what's going to happen. My hands still sweat, and I've been doing this for 20 some years. I still get nervous every time I come up here. You guys think I'm lying? No. Touch my hands. Some of us, you know, when you get, you know, get a phone call, instead of making you know, an excuse of why you can't pick somebody up for church, 
You need to say, you know what, I'll go pick him up. Instead of having the same people in church do it all time and time again. You know, that's how you get to know people too. Some of you are like, I don't want to know people. Some of us need to be a little less grumpy. You know, just being here, faithful, a faithful attendance every week. I just know that when I come in here, that there are certain people that I'm going to see every single week. Unless they've told me that they're going out of town on vacation or something like that. But I just know every single week they're going to be here. Like, it's like clockwork. I'm like, and you know how reassuring that is as a pastor to know that there are people that I can count on, that I know that are going to be here no matter what. Like when we go get Convoy of Hope, I know that there are at least three ladies that are going to be here at the church, if not four or five or more, that are sitting there waiting. We're like, all right, pastor, we cleaned up your mess that you made in that room, and now we're ready for the new stuff. Sorry, ladies. Tithing. Some of you need to step out you know, and, and believe the Lord in tithing, because the Bible says that when you tithe, he's going to bless you. He's going to throw open the, the windows of heaven to bless you by doing it. You never notice, I didn't sit there, you know, uh, during offering time, I was sitting there and going, all right. And like, look around and see who was like writing on their envelope. That's between you and the Lord. If you want, you, to me, it's like, you know what? I look at it, you know, two ways. If you get blessed by paying your tithe, and this is not some, you know, weird thing. If you get blessed by paying your tithe, because that's what the Bible says, then the reverse is true. You're not getting blessed because you're not paying your tithe. I prefer to be blessed. I, I, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. And participating. It is so awesome to see on Wednesday nights, you know, when we go to Taven, uh, people that normally don't, um, like, maybe speak up or speak out, just participating with the kids. Or the fact on Sunday morning, a lot of times, that they're participating with the kids. Or the fact of going to Sunday school and they're participating in Sunday school. But that's the way you learn also. Because you, you're not going to you know, know anything if you don't ask questions, if you just go, okay, okay, pastor, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you just keep going. That's why I appreciate it, you know, uh, when we have Bible studies on Wednesday night, questions being asked. Because the thing is, is that people, you know, that person or your persons wants to know a little bit more so they understand those things. So don't think that I'm, like, taken aback when you all of a sudden ask questions. But here's the thing. Most of the time, the reasons why things are not going well, and I... I touched on this a little bit earlier. When things are not going well, this is the reason we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And oftentimes, that's the reason why something doesn't seem right or we're unsettled in our spirit. It's because we're not doing what the Lord would ask us to do or would have us to do. So number one is be saved today, not tomorrow. Serve God today, number two. And number three is seek the Lord today. Verse 14, it says, For we are partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. How do we do this? Well, we seek him today privately. We seek him, uh, uh, we seek him today prayerfully. You know what? We also do have a prayer service tonight at 5 o'clock. It would be an awesome time for you to come. You know, we always have a good time praying for one another, praying for those in the church, praying for our community. But what the thing is, I know, you said, well, you, Pastor, you just said privately. Well, you can come out in public as well. It's okay. Just because the government tells you you can't do it in public, don't care. You can go out and pray private, or privately or publicly, but the thing is that you need to seek him no matter where you're at. You need to have that time privately and prayerfully today. You know why? Because that's how you're going to grow as well. As you're reading his word and he begins to speak to you about those things, you need to pray those, you know, you you need to pray what he's showing you. And then, you know what, also do those things as well. That we need to remain steadfast until the end to stay the course in your Christian life as long as you have breath in your lungs. One of the people in the Bible that I, that I see is the most consistent in their, in their walk is Daniel. If you ever you know, read the book of Daniel, he is the most steadfast believer you will ever read about in the Bible. He is one of my favorites. Oftentimes people think about Daniel and the lion's den, which, why not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good story, you know, it's a good thing that you know, happens in there. Also, I mean, you find out about Mad Rack, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you're into Veggie Tales, it's Rack, Shack, and Bendy, uh, uh, Benny. That's in that same thing. But the thing is that you will see throughout that entire book how consistent and faithful that he actually is. 
We need, to, uh, we need to be that way. We need to stay the course. Because, I mean, often, you know, obviously, he is, his life is, is showing so much growth. In, you know, there's so much growth in his life that other people are seeing it and they're mad about it. But that doesn't deter him. He says, you know what? I mean, think about the lion. He says, whether, basically, whether I'm eaten today by this lion or I live on to an old age, I'm still going to serve the Lord no matter what. And when one person stands up, then you got three. That's where you get Rack, Shack, and Benny. And then you get more and more people that will stand up. Why? Because one person, oftentimes people say, I don't want to be the only one. Sometimes you need to be the one. There was somebody, you know, saying, you know what, I felt like I should go down to the altar. But you know what, I didn't want to be the only one. But sometimes that's how it starts, is the fact that you have one person come down, and then more come, and then more come. That's how you know, we're going to get changed. Why? Because we're allowing the Lord to do what he's going to do at the altar. I know, you're, you know some of you may say, well, Pastor, didn't you just say that we shouldn't go down the altar and make it? Yeah, you should not make empty promises. That what you come down to the altar to do, that you intend to do. Don't forget about it as soon as you leave here. That's what I'm saying. I mean, my wife and I, we, uh, we had conversations about this entire time because I told her, she said, well, you, why haven't you been doing altar calls? And I said, because I, I don't want people making empty promises. And then, you know, we talked about it a little bit more and stuff, and then we kind of came to the whole thing is that it's up to you. But I, I didn't want to be, you know, the one advocating for people to come down to the altar and then making empty promises. So the answer is, is that if you come down to the altars, intend to keep, you know, that declaration that you're making. That when you come down to the altars and you're praying about it, and you're saying, God spoke to me about this. You know what? Come down here, pray, and then write it down so you don't forget. And then open it up. And then remember, maybe write it in your Bible so that way you remember those things. I mean, my, this Bible right here, it's got margins. I can write all I want in there. You're like, Pastor, this is an awful lot of blank space. Yeah, there is a little bit. I need to get back into, you know, in, 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 into writing in there. But, so number one was what? Be saved today, not tomorrow. Number two, serve God today. Number three, seek the, the Lord today. Number four is study the scriptures today. Study the scriptures today. Verses 15 and 16 it says, While it is today, today if you hear, if you hear my, uh, his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did not provoke, or sorry, did provoke. How be it, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. So not even, it wasn't just the ones that, you know, actually you know, went through the Red Sea. It was ones that were born after that, that were still provoking the Lord in anger. And what does it say? It says, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. So what does that mean? Hear it, do it. You got to hear his, where are you going to hear his voice? From his word. He wrote the Bible so that way you could hear his voice. You need to study his word. You need to memorize his word. So you don't forget, you know, the accounts like God using Moses to lead Israel out of the land of slavery and bondage, which is Egypt. I mean, did you know that every time in the Old Testament or even in the uh, sorry, Old Testament and New Testament, when it refers to Egypt, what is it referring to? It's referring to slave, uh, slavery and bondage. We say, well, how do you know that? Because that's how it's first used. Egypt was a land of slavery and bondage. And so it's still that way today. Because if you go and you're a believer in Egypt, they will kill you. And so how do you find those things out? Reading God's word and figuring it out and saying, you know what? If it says Egypt, he means this. Or if the Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah, he wants you to recall. Go back to Genesis 19, go back to Genesis 13 and find out what happened there. Because he's warning you about them back there. When he talks about you know, uh, uh, you know, side in an entire, it's because of what they did. Look those things up. He wants you to remember, not forget. But you can't remember if you don't read. You can't remember if you don't listen to it. You may not be the best of readers. Listen to God's word then. There are plenty of apps on your phone, plenty of app, you know, uh, different ways you can read it. Listen to it, hear it, just do it. You, you know the reason why you do these things? Because you need strength today, don't you? 
You need strength today. Acts chapter 20, verse 32 says this. It says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The Bible, the word of grace, is able to do what? Build you up, edify you, exhort you. That's how, you, uh, that's how you, you grow in your faith, is by reading God's word and applying it. And I know you say, well, pastor, that takes so much time. And playing video games doesn't, right? Watching TV doesn't, right? I've heard this you know, statement, and it's so true. You get in what you put in. If you don't put in the time, then you can't sit there and whine and cry that somebody else is, is beating you. I don't know if you could beat somebody in a Christian, you know, in your Christian walk, but I've heard people like whine and say, well, how is it that so-and-so is so much further along? Because they made the sacrifice to say, I'm not going to do this. I want to read God's word. You need to be sanctified today. What does that mean? You need to be cleansed. The Bible cleanses you and purifies you. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God wants you to be you know, cleansed, to get that junk out of your life. He doesn't want that, all, you to have all those painful memories and everything else that you did. He wants to clean you out. Sanctify means to be made holy and set apart for his use. If you're a believer, that should be your desire is to say, Lord, use me. Have you ever wondered why some are so much farther along in their Christian walk and it doesn't matter their age? You know the reason why I say it doesn't matter their age? Because I've met teenagers that are further along in their walk than those that have walked with the Lord for 50 years. And vice versa, I've met somebody that was just saved for, you know, for maybe a week that seems so much further than, you know, somebody that's been saved for 20, 30 years. That's a sad thing right there. But it happens. You have people out there, you know, that have just got saved and they're already on spiritual meat while the other ones are still on spiritual milk. Now think about that, you know, if that was literal. If I could go around and see what you were eating, I'd say, well, this person over here is eating meat, this one over here is eating, oh, wait, no, sorry, you're on milk. I mean, think about it. I think about the fact of that what he's talking about is that you're a baby. So it's not the fact that you're just getting a glass of milk and going drinking it. No, you have a little nipple on the top of that thing, and you're just sucking like a little baby over there. That's where you're at. That's what the Bible refers to it as, is that you're still, you know, uh, you're still got the little baby bottle, and you're still, you know, ga ga goo and you're not over there having a nice steak, you know, just, I was about to raise, uh, I was going to, you know, thank Tim for, you know, still uh, uh, recommending the Grecian steak. I have that in my mind now, thanks, Tim. I say thanks because it was actually a good thing. You haven't had their steak over there, go over there, have their steak, it's good. The reason why, obviously, is they're allowing the Lord to sanctify them by the truth of his word. You need to allow the Lord to cleanse you, uh, to make you holy, to, so that way his truth gets in you and the lies get out of you. So number one is, be saved, uh, be saved today, not tomorrow. Number two was, uh, serve, the, uh, serve God today. Number three, seek the Lord today. Number four, study the scriptures today. Number five is, strengthen your brother Strengthen your brother. Verse 13, it says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Oftentimes people you know, want to get built up on Sundays and possibly maybe Wednesdays if they get around to it. Let me, talk, let me ask you this question. How strong are you going to be if you only eat once a week? You only eat once a week, you're going to be walking around like, Ugh. I can't handle it. But you're getting your, your three square meals of God's word every single day. You're going to be strengthened. You're going to be you know, working out. You're going to be like a power lifter over there. Nobody that is healthy only eats once a week. So we need to exhort one another daily. That means the fact is, is, you know what, talking to somebody else. Iron sharpens iron. Get to talk to them. Read God's word. Study his word so you're getting that meal and you're doing all these things to, to do what? Build yourself up. Build the other person up. Help them. If they have questions, help them. If you both don't know, 
Read the Bible to find out. Hebrews chapter uh, 3, verse 17 and 19 says this. It says, but with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that uh, they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they can, uh, could not enter in because of unbelief. You say, well, pastor, that's about unsaved people. Christians oftentimes will get saved and often continue to do what they were doing before they got saved. And you know what? There's a reason why procrastinators are usually the ones that have the most anxiety. Procrastinators are the ones that usually have the most anxiety. Why? Because they keep putting things off and then their plate gets fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller until they cannot handle it anymore. And then they burn out or they shut down. If you do things as they come and you say, I, uh, you know, I, today I'm going to do this and get that done. Tomorrow I'm going to do this and get that done. And you keep going away. Lo and behold, you know, your, your task list is going to get smaller and smaller. But you know, here's the thing is, is that you can read God's word and it never runs out of truth. That no matter how many times you read the Bible, no matter how much you study it, there's always something new that you're learning. There's always something new. But you say, well, pastor, I don't know if I can do that. You know what? Here's the thing. If you strengthen your brother today, you're stopping them from getting hurt tomorrow. Because if they're strengthened today, they're going to be built up in the Lord, and they're going to be able to take on whatever life hands them that day because you strengthened them today. If you're strengthened today, all this, all the, you know, everything can come against you tomorrow, but you're going to be able to withstand it. Why? Because you worked out today. Number one, be saved today, not tomorrow. Number two, serve God today. Number three, seek the Lord today. Number four, study the scriptures today. Number five, strengthen your brother today. Number six, be a soul winner today. What's a soul winner, Pastor? It's a person that seeks to win souls for Christ. Where do I get that from? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, it says this, The fruit of the righteous is, the tree, is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So when we go knocking door to door today at 3 o'clock, like we normally do on Sundays, you say, well, Pastor, I can't do it on Sundays. You can do it any other day of the week. Talk to your coworkers. Talk to somebody else. You know, talk to whoever you're working with. Talk to whoever you meet at the grocery store. Talk to whoever. You say, "Well, Pastor, that's a little awkward." Isn't it going to be a little bit more awkward if that person, you know, if you're up in heaven? Not that you can actually do this, but that you're up in heaven and the person's in hell. That's a little awkward, isn't it? But we know obviously that can't happen because you know we know the story of Abraham that he was. He was talking and, you know, he was able for that moment to be able to talk, uh, talk across the great chasm. But we can't talk, you can't talk to people in hell when you're in heaven. I mean, why would you want to see that? You're in heaven. There's no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more, no more sadness in heaven. That's what's in hell. Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 says, But what uh, think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He didn't say tomorrow, today. You know why? Because it is our responsibility to share the gospel. It's not the heathens. It's our responsibility to share the gospel. We say, well, you know, well, Pastor, why do you keep on talking about the heathen? Well, you know what? You can trust the heathen if you want to. Then you can watch shows like The Chosen that were written by, uh, by Mormons and Catholics. You say, well, Pastor, that's why it's so much different and weird. Or you can go, you know, Pastor, I'm going to trust what Mel Gibson said because, you know, the passion of the Christ, man, it's amazing. He's Catholic too. No, I'm going to, you know, listen to Fox News. So Bill O'Reilly all of a sudden has the Bible? Oh, well, yeah, no, sorry. He got fired from there, so he has his own channel. Tucker Carlson, oh, wait, no, he got fired too. But you're still going to listen to all these people about what it, why don't you read it for yourself? 
and go win somebody for the gospel. I've never heard somebody on their deathbed say, you know what, Pastor, I have so many regrets. Man, all the people that I led to the Lord, I regret that the most. I've never heard anybody say that on their deathbed. But what I have heard people say on their deathbed is that painful regret that they never shared the gospel with somebody else or they didn't do it enough. It's gotten awful quiet in there. Luke chapter 16, verses 28 and 29 says this. It says, For I have five brethren. This is a, a person who is in hell, talking about his five brothers. It says, For I have five brethren, that I may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He goes on to you know, sit there and say, he says, you know what? They won't li- if, they didn't listen to, uh, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen to me, even if I did raise from the dead. So all these miraculous things, 23 seconds in hell and 23 hours in hell and all these other weird, stupid books out there that everybody keeps on buying for some odd reason. Don't buy these books, please. I'm not calling you stupid. I'm just saying I wish that these authors would stop writing stuff so people would quit buying them. The Shack? Don't buy The Shack. You know, they're like, well, it talks about the Trinity. The Trinity in, in there is the woman. And other weird stuff that they have in there. Don't read Jesus Calling. I know there are some in here that have. You know where she got the ideas? She said, well, I went out to this area and I got all alone to myself and I, and I let God speak to me. And there's so much stuff in there that is not biblical. And yet people are like, oh, this is great. This is good stuff. I never read this. You know why you never read it in the Bible before? Because it's not in there. It's like, oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. I've never seen this before. Because it's not in the Bible. Oh, the circle maker. Oh, wait, that's an AG person. Yes, it is. Oh, I'm going to break a circle around myself. And I'm not going to leave this circle until God answers my That's from the Talmud. That's a Jewish, you know, the Jewish rabbinical teaching book that calls Jesus the bastard son of Mary. Why would you read that? People are like, I never, because it's not in his word. Here's another thing is that you have people who will come out and say, well, I'm a prophet. No, you're not. The only way you're a prophet is in this definition. It's one who speaks for one another, especially one who speaks for God and interprets his will to man. In other words, it's a pastor or a preacher, or if you know what, you're going out and you're teaching somebody, then yes, you are a prophet as far as what God's word says, but you're not coming up with anything new. And if you are, you're a heretic and you're a false prophet. Like I said, God does not correct himself. The canon of scripture is closed. You don't add to it or take away from it unless you want something to happen to you. Not good. Be saved today, number one, not tomorrow. Serve the Lord today. Number three, seek the Lord today. Number four, study the scriptures today. Number five, strengthen your brother today. Number six, be a soul winner today. And number seven, if it wasn't plain enough for you, submit to the Lord today. Submit to the Lord today. Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8 says this, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if we will hear, if ye uh, will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, and, and, and it, as is in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Sound familiar from Hebrews chapter 3? The Apostle Paul didn't come up with something new in Hebrews chapter 3. He's quoting the Old Testament. So God's been telling this for years to submit to the Lord, to do what God asks us to do, to not sit there and just keep doing what we want to do and then wonder why things blow up in our face. Because every day's day's delay is disobedience. Every time you say, I'm going to wait until tomorrow, I'm going to do it tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow, 
That's disobedience. Every day's delay is disobedience. Every day's delay is destructive. And you say, well, who is it destructive towards? It's destructive to yourself. It's destructive to others. And it's destructive to the cause of Christ. Because you know what? There's often times where I've met a person who said, you know, I just saw so-and-so. And I just found out that they passed away. And I just saw him yesterday. And I was going to, I was going to tell them about the Lord. Don't wait for tomorrow to do what you can do today. Don't sit there and procrastinate. I used to have the shirt. That's the reason why I got that saying is procrastinators unite tomorrow. Because that's what a procrastinator does is that they have all the time in the world. Why? Because they're going to do it tomorrow. They're going to meet tomorrow. And then oftentimes people will sit up and anxiety ridden because why? Because they knew what they should have been doing, but they weren't doing it. There's nothing better than going out and doing what God has asked you to do today. And then you know what? When you, your head hits the pillow at night, you're able to sleep peacefully, able to go to sleep right away because you're exhausted. Why? Because you're doing the Lord's work. I think oftentimes people think that being exhausted because you're doing the Lord's work is bad. It's like, no, I got more important things to do. What thing do you have that's more important than sharing the Lord with people? What's more important than the Lord's work? Oftentimes people say, well, Pastor, I I can't do this because I need to go, I'm going to go talk to a family member about Jesus. That's the Lord's work, that's more important than me asking you to vacuum a rug or something. And I see grandmas out there taking care of their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. You're working for the Lord. Ladies, don't ever sit there and think, because maybe you're a stay-at-home mom. You're like, I'm a stay-at-home mom, and all I do is take care of kids all day. That is your ministry. Your kids are your most important ministry. Don't sit there and ever, uh, you know, ever wonder and say, you know what, I, sorry, Pastor, I wish that I was able to go over to, you know, to go do this outreach or go do this one, but I have the kids. That's your outreach. Your kids are your outreach. Don't let it, don't let us, you know, everything like just slip through your fingers. I'll repeat this one last time. Is this, number one, obviously, be saved today, not tomorrow. Serve God today. Seek God today. Study the scriptures today. Strengthen your brother today. Be a soul winner today and submit to the Lord today. For some of us, we may sit there and say, well, pastor, it sounds like those who are being diligent and doing the Lord's work never get rest, but I thought you said that it was the procrastinator that never got rest. You know, the procrastinator never gets rest because of the fact that uh, their mind is so filled with what they didn't do. The person that is diligent in the Lord's work can sleep well, can go to bed so easily. Why? Because they've done what the Lord has asked them and their mind is clear. So like, you know what, I've done what the Lord has asked me to do. There's no more, nothing more satisfying, nothing more uh, you know, fulfilling than those things. A procrastinator is always unsettled in their mind. And I would argue that much of our anxiety and fears would go away if we would focus on what the Lord would have us to do. Then constantly filling up our lives with, only, with things that only matter for a short period of time or don't matter at all. You say, what am I talking about? I've never seen so many people so engrossed by one small object. I've seen people, people give me a dirty look because I'm watching where I'm going, and they're over here like this, and they bump into me. This is a great you know, tool, but don't let the tool control you. This is a great thing right here, but when you're driving, this should be nowhere near your hand. This is a great tool to do things, but the thing is, is that there's a reason why Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those ones, even games, have people that will sit there and figure out and try and figure out why 
or how they can make a game more addictive. Because they get paid for how long you stay on that thing. And you say, well, no, it was a free game. They get paid. It's called ads. And the more ads that are shown, the more they get paid. And so they're like, yes, we're going to make this as addictive as possible because we want to get paid no matter what. They don't care about you. They care about how much money they're making. And the thing is that oftentimes people that are filled with anxiety and fear is what? Is that they're scared all the time. They jump all the time. They're all those things. But I know that the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I leave you with this one last thought. I said it a little bit earlier, but I'm going to reiterate it again. When you are working for the Lord, you will, be, you will most likely be exhausted at the end of the day. But there will not be a lot of things or distractions that won't get, uh, get in your way. There won't be any laziness. It's not for people, I'm so tired, and they've done nothing. It's because sitting around makes you tired. This body wasn't made you know, to be sedentary. It wasn't made to just sit you know, in a chair all day. It was made to move. You have nothing to do. I've heard that excuse. I have nothing to do. Or they complain and they argue. They gossip. They backbite. You know, they're angry. Oh, wait, and sorry, that's on TikTok and that's on YouTube and that's on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. How many more social media sites do we need? And like I said, you will have a clear mind. Why? When you do what? Uh, you're about your father's business because you're going to have a clear mind because you're not just filling your mind with everything on your phone or any, everything that is around you, but you're about his business. I'll tell you, one of the days that I sleep the best is Sundays. You say, well, yeah, because you're up here you know, preaching. No, it's because I do so much more around there that maybe you know, some of you don't know that, you know, uh, that we do. Why? Because I'm doing the Lord's work on that day. Other days, I'm, I'm just as tired. You say, well, no, because, Pastor, don't you only work on Sundays and Wednesdays? If you're a Christian, you don't work just on Sundays and Wednesdays. You work seven days a week, 365, there is no days off, right? You say, well, you have to take time off, you know, like a vacation or something like that. I'm still trying to tell people about the Lord on vacation. That's not, I'm not tooting my own horn, I'm not doing whatever, I'm just saying... We should always be about the Father's business. We shouldn't say, well, that's the pastor's job, or that's the deacon's job. It's our job as believers, our job to share the gospel. So for the next few moments, you guys can come up to the altar. Don't make any empty empty promises. Come up, uh, if you uh, come up here, say, Lord, I'm going to, this is what you've been speaking to me about. This is how I'm going to take care of it. And then write it down so you don't forget it. But for the next few moments, if you feel that the Lord has led you to come down to the altar, to sit there and say, Lord, I need to work out some stuff between you and I. Come on down.